Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we look at the NICE guideline on cardiovascular risk reduction and lipid modification, or NG238, which was published in December 2023, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. In this episode, we're going to cover statins for both primary and secondary prevention, assessing response to treatment, optimizing therapy, and what to do when statins are contraindicated or not tolerated. If you have not already done so, I recommend that you watch the previous introductory video on the subject covering cardiovascular risk assessment, recommendations for specialist referral and considerations before starting starting therapy. The link is in the episode description. If you'd like a refresher on the NICE guidance on cardiac chest pain and the management of stable angina, please refer to the corresponding episodes on this channel. The links are also in the episode description. Right, let's jump into it. We're going to start reviewing the prescribing of statins for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And before offering a statin, we will discuss the benefits of lifestyle changes and optimize the management of all other modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. Then, if lifestyle changes are not sufficient, we will offer statin treatment. Equally, before starting statins, we will treat comorbidities and secondary causes of dyslipidemia, which include, for example, excess alcohol, uncontrolled diabetes, hypothyroidism, liver disease, and nephrotic syndrome. Is there a cholesterol target for primary prevention? And the answer is yes. For primary prevention, we should aim for a greater than 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol. So, who should get statins for primary prevention? Well, we will offer a tolvastatin 20 mg for primary prevention to people with and without type 2 diabetes who have a 10-year Q-risk 3 score of 10% or more. However, NICE states that we should not rule out statins just because Q-risk 3 score is less than 10%. If there is a patient preference for taking it or there is a concern that the risk may be underestimated. Let's remember that we do not estimate Q-Risk 3 for people already with an increased cardiovascular risk, that is, those aged 85 and older, people with type 1 diabetes and people with CKD. What do we do with them? Well, for those aged 85 and older, we should also consider treatment with atolvastatin 20 mg because they are at increased risk because of age alone. Obviously, being aware that there may be factors that may make treatment inappropriate in these cases. For the second group, that is those with type 1 diabetes, NICE makes a distinction as to when we must definitely offer a statin and when we should simply consider it. But in summary, a total statin 20 mg daily should be considered for everyone with type 1 diabetes over the age of 18, irrespective of the duration of their diabetes. This advice is even more emphatic if they are aged over 40, they have had diabetes for more than 10 years, they have established nephropathy, or they have other cardiovascular disease risk factors. Although it may be simpler for us to remember that all people with type 1 diabetes over the age of 18 would benefit from a total start in 20 mg. And for the third group, that is for people with CKD, we will review their guidance a little later. This is because the management in CKD is the same for both primary and secondary prevention and it would be better to discuss it after we go through the recommendations for secondary prevention. So, what are the recommendations for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease? Well, these recommendations apply to those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, both with and without type 1 and type 2 diabetes. However, they do not apply to people with CKD, which we will discuss separately. What is the lipid target in secondary prevention? Well, we should aim for LDL levels of 2 millimol per liter or less, or non HDL cholesterol levels of 2.6 millimol per liter or less. And to achieve this, we will offer atovastatin 80 milligrams, whatever their cholesterol level, although we would offer a lower dose if it could react with other drugs there is a high risk of adverse effects, or the person would prefer to take a lower dose. We will discuss lifestyle changes at the same time, but we should not delay statin treatment because of it. 
Also, in primary prevention, we were advised to treat comorbidities and secondary causes of dyslipidemia before starting statins. However, in secondary prevention, we will do this at the same time as starting statin treatment. If the person is taking a maximum tolerated dose and intensity of statins, but the lipid target for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease is not met, we should consider additional lipid lowering treatments. And for this, we should consider acetimibe, as well as injectables such as alirucumab, evolucumab, and inclutherin. Each one has their own nice guidance. However, we can consider acetimibe in addition to the maximum tolerated statin dose to reduce cardiovascular risk further, even if the lipid target for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease is met. This is because studies have shown that the combination is effective in reducing cardiovascular events and acetimibe is cost-effective regardless of cholesterol levels. So now let's look at our special group, people with CKD but excluding those on renal replacement therapy. For both primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in CKD, we will offer atulvastatin 20 mg. If the lipid target for primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease is not met and EGFR is 30 or higher, we will increase the dose of atulvastatin. However, if the EGFR is less than 30, we will discuss it with the renal team. When it comes to optimizing treatment for people on statins, for everyone else other than for people with CKD, if the lipid target for primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease is not met, we will reinforce adherence and lifestyle advice, and we will consider increasing the statin intensity and or dose if the person is not currently taking the maximum tolerated dose of a high-intensity statin. And let's remember that the only doses of statins that are considered high intensity based on the percentage reduction in LDL cholesterol that they can produce are atorvastatin 20 to 80 mg and usuvastatin 10 to 40 mg. Lower doses as well as the rest of the other statins will fall in the medium or low intensity statin category. If the person reports adverse events when taking a high-intensity statin, we will discuss the following options. Stopping the statin and trying again when the symptoms have resolved to check if the symptoms are related to the statin, changing to a different statin in the same intensity group, for example, rusuvastatin if already receiving atorvastatin, or reducing the dose or changing to a lower-intensity statin, explaining that any statin at any dose reduces cardiovascular risk. If statins are contraindicated or not tolerated for secondary prevention, we will offer acetimibe instead. This applies whatever the person's cholesterol level. If the person is taking acetimibe, but the lipid target for secondary prevention is not met, we should consider alternatives or additional lipid lowering treatments such as oral benpedoic acid and injectables such as alirucumab Evolocumab and Enclithirin. How do we assess response to treatment? Well, we should measure liver transaminase and the full lipid profile at two to three months after starting or changing lipid lowering treatment. We will then measure liver transaminase levels at 12 months, but not again unless clinically indicated. We should also advise people on statins to seek medical advice if they develop unexplained muscle symptoms like pain tenderness or weakness. If this occurs, we will measure creatine kinase. If creatine kinase level is less than five times the upper limit of normal, we will reassure them that their symptoms are unlikely to be due to the statin and explore other possible causes. However, we will not measure creatine kinase levels in asymptomatic people who are being treated with statin. When checking glucose levels or HbA1c, we will not stop statins because of an increase in blood glucose level or HbA1c. And we will remind the person to restart the statin is to stop taking it because of drug interactions or during intercurrent illnesses. Patients on lipid lowering treatments should have an annual medication review, offering an annual full lipid profile to inform discussions, encouraging adherence, lifestyle changes and addressing cardiovascular disease risk factors. 
We should also discuss with people who are stable on a low-intensity statin or medium-intensity statin the likely benefits and potential risks of changing to a high-intensity statin and agree whether a change is needed. Right, so we have looked at the lipid-lowering treatments that can be recommended, primarily statins and acetimibe, followed by alirucumab, evolucumab, inclisiran, and benpedoic acid, if necessary, and meeting the individualized guidance. On the other hand, lipid-lowering treatments that should not be recommended for primary and secondary prevention, including people with diabetes and CKD, are fibrates, nicotinic acid, bile acid sequestrants, and omega-3 fatty acid compounds, with the exception of eicosapentethyl, which has its own guidance for people with raised triglycerides. However, these treatments not recommended do not apply to people with familial hypercholesterolemia, which has got its own guidance and for whom fibrates and other agents may be prescribed. And that is it, the second part of the NICE guideline on cardiovascular risk reduction in primary care. Make sure to check the previous introductory episode if you have not already done so. As always, remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.